everyone. Next in line, we have yet another special session, Dr. Fred Hu, founder, chairman and CEO of Primavera Capital. The session will be moderated by Datu Amirul Faisal Wan Zahir, Managing Director, Kazana. Over to you, Datu. Thank you, Shamira. Um, and welcome, uh, Dr. Fred Hu, or Fred. Um, it's a real honor to have you in our Kazana Megatrends Forum here uh, this afternoon. Um, you know, before we begin, begin, perhaps I can briefly give an introduction. So for the benefit of the uh, audience, um, more about Dr. Fred Hu. over $15 billion US. Now, early in his career, Fred was partner and chairman of Greater China at Goldman Sachs Group, instrumental in building Goldman's franchise in the region. In fact, he was Goldman's first ever chairman of Greater China, during which time he has uh, led some of the most <clears throat> landmark capital markets transactions in China's history and building strong relationships with a variety of government uh, and business leaders along the way. And indeed, he is a highly respected economist and is a trusted policy advisor to the Chinese government uh, on various aspects, including financial reform, SOE restructuring, and macroeconomic policies. And um, many might not know this, but Fred entered university at 16 years old, very young. And uh, he holds a master's degree in engineering science from Tsinghua University and a master's degree and PhD in economics from Harvard University and is the co-director at the National Center of Economic Research and professor at Tsinghua University since 1996, as well as a member of editorial board of several academic journals and columnists of, uh, for China's leading business magazines. So welcome, Fred. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. Thank you, um, Fezu. Yeah. Um, we, we met briefly uh, before, and, and I asked you a question which I found uh, the answer to be quite fascinating, and, and that is Primavera Capital, the name Primavera. I mean, for a, for a private equity firm in China, I thought that was intriguing. Can, can you just explain how you came up with the name Primavera? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so it's really... Uh, derived from the Chinese um, proverb, uh, or idiom, uh, you know, it's basically about the farmers, um, you know, like investor, we believe, you know, just like a farmer, you know, we have to uh, embrace, uh, you know, diligence, uh, prudence, and patience. Um, so that's uh, the origin, you know, the, uh, the name and the, the, the meanings behind it. So the meaning is is um, oh that's interesting. But how how what, is that not an Italian <laughs> more than Chinese name? <laughs> how did how did you choose an Italian? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Right. Yes. Um, yeah. So, so in Italian, it means spring. Uh, so, so that's uh, corresponding to the first part of Chinese uh, proverb. And I myself are actually a big fan of uh, Italian Renaissance culture and history. And uh, there is actually uh, a masterpiece uh, by Sandro Battaccini uh, with the name Primavera. Uh, that uh, work is displayed in the um, uh, Uffizi Museum uh, in Florence. Uh, okay, so I'm going to take that a bit because, you know, it's, it's actually quite interesting when you talk about um, sowing the seeds. Um, I, I, I got here diligence, uh, patience, um, and... And for that, investing in that way in, in China, which which um, which is actually quite interesting. Um, why, why I say that is because China is so significant to the world. Um, it's Malaysia's largest trading partner. Uh, it's it's the same for many Southeast Asian uh, countries as well. And and whatever China does, you know, the, the moment China sneezes, the whole world kind of like shakes, right? So. 
So, you know, when 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 you talk about um, uh, patience and perseverance, now when we look at China, for example, what seems to be hitting a lot of the the headlines uh, is one where we see a lot of regulatory changes, um, which which is you know which is quite uh, abrupt in a way, and and of course you know we 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 hear. Um, you know, trying to understand what under, what's underpinning all these changes, and and uh, we hear President Xi's concept of common prosperity uh, being being you know the, uh, what is underpinning a lot of these changes. But but having said that, it's caused a lot of um, uh, I guess confusion in this, and maybe maybe we can share your thoughts. Um, you know, in 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 investing in China, where you do need some patience. Can you share with us what the thinking is behind this and implications to China and the economy? Absolutely, I'd be happy to. But the, before, you know, just first let me just thank you, uh, Faisal, and the, you know, you and your colleagues at the Kozana uh, for organizing such a, an important forum. Uh, the quality of the program is just terrific. Um, uh, we're honored to be part of it. Um, you know, the, the recent um, uh, sweeping policy actions in China uh, you know, have uh, garnered uh, a lot of attention, uh, both domestically and internationally. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, rattled the global markets. Uh, you know, people are baffled by uh, President Xi Jinping's notion of uh, common prosperity. Uh, the term uh, in Chinese, uh, means uh, shared prosperity uh, or prosperity for all uh, instead of for only a few. So I would say uh, definitely uh, with no reservation, uh, this is actually quite an attractive vision and uh, a highly important and worthwhile public policy objective uh, for China. Uh, some uh, some uh, Western commentators, however, uh, say, you know, by raising this banner of common prosperity, uh, the Chinese leader uh, intends to turn the clock back, so to speak, you know, to retreat from uh, decades old reform, uh, reassert the Maoist ideology, and uh, uh, take a more uh, hostile approach towards the private sector and the free markets. I uh, don't believe this is right. Uh, I, I think such a view um, has uh, misinterpreted uh, the China's uh, long-term policy vision. Uh, there's actually nothing sinister uh, about the uh, common prosperity. Uh, in essence, uh, it's really just a different way of saying inclusive growth uh, or growth with equity. So what's wrong with that? Yes, that there's a in 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 Malay in Malaysia we have the same thing. It's called Makmur Bersama. Which is shared prosperity, and and to be honest with you, you're absolutely right. Um, well, when you look at the principles behind it, especially in today's world where you have, um, even even with the pandemic, right? I mean, the pandemic has really, really shown um, the the fragilities of the current socio economic system, uh, and we have the those who have um, are are getting more advanced, and then you have inequalities uh, actually widening. Um, as as we go forward, so fully appreciate the um, uh, the you know to 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 have this vision of common prosperity or in Bahasa, more bersama. So all I think all countries would would definitely um, uh, see see the the positives of that. And I think for China with the with the population that you have, I think it's 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 definitely um, uh, something which uh, is is needed. Um, and and I think. That's that's one of the things. I think you're, you're right. Um, uh, perhaps it's a different perspective of how um, we we see it. You know, uh, as as Asian communities or in China versus perhaps a Western uh, perspective. But when you look at these things, these are common values, 
and you're you're unique because you you you've you've seen both sides of the world in China, as well as the Western world. I, I, rather than look at the differences, do you see any commonalities? And where, um, you know, we hear ESG is is it is it the China brand for ESG? And maybe you can share some thoughts. Yes, I think it's interesting you brought you bring this up. You know, I think it's quite uh, related to that. Um, you know, and this policy, uh, uh, you know, common prosperity actually is not new. Um, it, China has been more or less pursuing the same strand of policy pretty consistently uh, for the last four decades. Uh, at the beginning of the reform, Deng Xiaoping envisioned the best way to achieve common prosperity is by letting some people get rich first. Uh, and unleashed the uh, tremendous entrepreneurial energy uh, in China. So for for several decades in a row, uh, you know, as the fastest growing major economy, uh, China has uh, succeeded in lifting over seven hundred million our people out of poverty. So that's you know six single greatest defeat in the human history. Um, at the same time, uh, sustained the boom economic boom. Uh, has created the fabulous wealth, uh, minting billionaires at a very fast pace. You know, just to take 2020, uh, for example, China gained a stunning number of new 239 uh, US dollar billionaires, despite the pandemic and its devastating impact on the economy. So China is rapidly catching up with the U.S. with a total of um, almost 700 you know, billionaires uh, compared to 724 in the U.S. What marks the difference, though, is that uh, all the wealth in China probably has been created within the last decade or two, whereas the U.S. probably you know, built up uh, for a longer period of time. So not that surprisingly, uh, the wealth gap in China has widened uh, dramatically. Um, a couple of years ago, when you know China's Gini coefficient uh, at thirty eight point five is almost comparable to that of the US, it just you know still still started below the US uh, at forty one point four, uh, but it exists both Russia and India, also the two countries known for inequality. Um, so if you were the ruling party, CCP, and the President Xi, you got to be concerned about the rising inequality for the sake of um, social and the political stability. You know, in fact, as you have pointed out, you know, in- income inequality is a global issue. You know, at least partially has caused the uh, social polarizations and the political maelstroms around the world be it the Brexit uh, or the rise of Trumpism uh, in the U.S. So across a wide spectrum of um, uh, political models and uh, systems worldwide, governments, be it democratic or one-party state, actually struggle to cope with the uh, uh, inequality. The Nordic countries may have done uh, a pretty good job, but they're just uh, quite small and culturally uh, homogeneous. Uh, so maybe very limited application uh, to other uh, elsewhere. Uh, the US, of course, loves to lecture other countries uh, about how to govern, but um, you know, clearly the US is not a shining model as far as uh, inequality is concerned. Now, you know, China has actually um, reached a point where its leadership makes common possibility as a top national priority. Uh, in terms of income distribution curve, uh, China aspires to build uh, a so-called olive shaped society with the vast majority of the population uh, being middle class instead of a pyramid one where the top 1% uh, takes the vast majority of the wealth. So this is a laudable, uh, but a challenging uh, undertaking. Uh, however, if China does succeed 
in bring its vision uh, into reality, I think it would be a wonderful thing. It may offer some uh, useful experience for other countries. Uh, in any case, uh, I believe as investors, we should rest assured that such a policy is not necessarily anti-private sector and nor investor unfriendly, uh, but really about the achieving socially, uh, politically, and of course environmentally sustainable uh, growth, you know, ESG, as you pointed out, you know. So in, instead of panic and resistance, I believe we should embrace it uh, as partners and agents of change. Thank you for that. I mean, that's that's a very interesting perspective um, that that you mentioned, and and that's actually quite interesting because you mentioned that this is something which um, it's, it, it's it may seem abrupt, but this is something that's being looked at over decades as um, you know China engineers to. Uh, to um, increase the wealth and 700 million population out of poverty. You're right; it's, it's an amazing feat, um, and the rapidness of the uh, the wealth creation uh, has been fairly um, incredible, uh, uh, to say the least. Um, as as investors, and, and and coming back to your philosophy um, uh, of investing, of um, you know, I, I guess rigor and diligence the patience and, and understanding the uh, the prudence etc of china um how how um what what other areas um i guess should we be cautious about because you know the pattern has been fairly relaxed to grow rapidly and then a pretty tight control uh, and, and that seems to be the model but as investors um uh, we, we, we understand common prosperity, uh, but what about other areas that we might be um, uh, we, we should be looking at? I mean, I, I I ask this because you know while we have common prosperity, uh, we also hear um, uh, the rule where I would love to implement at home, which is basically having my kids two hours of of, uh, of uh, because I have young kids of of, uh, of of games at home, but that that goes to family as well, uh, family value. So. Uh, how how do we? Um, uh, what's your thoughts there? I mean, apart from common prosperity, what else is is being looked at? Well, yeah, uh, first of all, as you know, that uh, the, the tech regulations uh, in China, you know, have also been in uh, you know, grabbing um, global headlines uh, recently. Um, uh, it is mostly because China, the digital economy, you know, is already enormously big and uh, enorm enormously successful. So uh, I believe the government uh, should be concerned about some, you know, possible issues like uh, excessive uh, market power, uh, big tech platforms, um, you know, anti-competitive behaviors, data security, uh, or like user privacy. Um, you know, actually these three issues, I would say, you know, are certainly uh, not unique to China uh, alone, but uh, very much global uh, issues. Um, uh, EU, for example, has been uh, quite proactive uh, taking on the big tech, uh, whereas US and China had historically uh, been more uh, hands-off um, although, you know, uh, as we know, China has uh, turned a lot more Proactive recently, uh, probably well ahead of other larger economic blocks. Um, although in the US, probably also starting to scrutinize uh, the big tech uh, more uh, closely under the Biden administration. So, so my point is, like it or not, you know, tech regulation, uh, just like financial regulations uh, post the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, uh, increasingly global. Uh, investors, you know, may choose to shy away from China for now, just because of all what's going on. But it is unlikely uh, people can really upcharge uh, jurisdictions for long, because there will be no safe haven for tech 
as far as regulations are concerned about uh, you know antitrust, uh, data, and uh, privacy. So, you know, but but uh, you know, uh, I, I, I see many the regulatory actions uh, are justified in terms of goals and intentions. Uh, however, I do take issue uh, with the approaches. I do think they are unnecessarily heavy-handed, and uh, there were extremely poor communications throughout, hence triggering a massive sell-off and the market panic. So if I were a school teacher to grade the recent regulatory performance, maybe I'd give 60% you know, good, you know, which makes sense, but 40%, you know, maybe not so much. Um, you know, but but uh, on the other hand, you know, with short term damages, uh, the, the government action may well bear some positive uh, fruits down the road. Uh, one positive uh, and immediate outcome I should point out is the opening up to each other of Alibaba and the Tencent uh, uh, tech ecosystems to each other. That's uh, you know long overdue. Uh, another example is uh, privacy. The new personal information protection law called the PIPL. You know that's really one of the strictest in the world. It partially draw inspiration from Europe's uh, GDPR, but I think going much further. Um, so the PIPL integrates the general principle of GDPR but the China's own distinctive uh, national conditions. Uh, frankly, you know, as a uh, proactive, uh, prolific tech investors, I see many successful consumer internet business in China have uh, for too long uh, taken a cavalier attitude towards consumer privacy and the data. Um, now they are forced to comply uh, with regulations and make changes uh, to safeguard the data and privacy. So these changes are long overdue uh, and I think it will help uh, regain public trust. Hence, I think in tech companies' uh, best interest. So the bottom line is despite the short-term uncertainty, I believe China tech uh, will become uh, actually more competitive, uh, healthier, and likely more innovative uh, ecosystem. Actually, that's that's very interesting because you're right. When you actually look at the um, what's happening in the West, um, responsible use of data. I know um, the likes of uh, Facebook has hit the headlines on on issues such as that, um, and and it's quite common. Um, and the U.S. and Europe are also looking at that as well. Um, so, so I guess you know w what is interesting is. Um, there is that common uh, commonality of what's happening globally: antitrust, um, responsible use of data, um, in a way, facing inequality. Um, you know, managing that. Um, uh, we, you mentioned about uh, GDPR, and of course, the um, uh, personal privacy as well. Um, and so, so there is that commonality. And do, first of all. Um, do, do you think that that's what we should be looking at um, in, in trying to understand the journey of China when it comes to regulatory changes? And that's one question. And the other question I have is what you mentioned on approach. Um, and you, gave, you didn't give a good score on approach, but um, how, how, do we, how do you manage that as investors going forward? Um, yeah. You know, so, you know, this is a challenge, you know, I, uh, for all of us, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty, you know, a uh, lot of confusion. Uh, so we have to be very clear eyed about the short term risks and uncertainties. But also, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, keep a sense in, in a global perspective and also a long term uh, perspective. You know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the regulatory actions because they are quite heavy handed, you know, so and poorly communicated. So it caused a lot of uh, confusion, concern, and uh, jitterness uh, in the market. Um, so some investors uh, may choose to stay on the sidelines. Uh, in fact, there are signs that uh, international capital 
uh, now scared of China is shifting towards other hot markets such as India uh, or Indonesia. Um, you know, I, I was I understand completely uh, the sentiments, uh, but uh, we at the Pamirera, uh I was I'm faced by uh, these uh, short term uh, uncertainties. Uh, I think the long term uh, structural trends such as innovation. Uh, you know, middle class consumption, you know, remain uh, intact. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, you know, want to take advantage of the uh, current depressed valuation <laughs> and remain, you know, proactively investing in uh, dynamic innovative growth enterprise that have um, uh, potential uh, to create a value uh, for investors. Uh, but also consumers, employees, and the society uh, at, at large. You know, one, one thing I should turn as when you, you ask the other areas, you know, other, you know, um, so the, the, the crackdown right now mostly is focused on the uh, consumer internet, but there are many larger and exciting uh, segments of tech that remain only well aligned with the government the visions and the priorities but actually show tremendous uh, growth potential, such as semiconductors, AI, robotics, industrial uh, automation, enterprise software, uh, medical technologies, you know, from devices to pharmaceuticals, especially uh, AI-driven uh, uh, therapeutics. And the last but not least, you know, climate change solutions, uh, namely renewable energy, uh, electrical vehicles and the next gen, high density, larger scale, and the safe energy storage systems, notably uh, uh, EV batteries. That's that's actually quite interesting, actually, because um, uh, it, that, <laughs> there's a lot more opportunities, obviously, um, when when you actually look at what's what's available. Um, you know, what you mentioned about some of the foreign investors shying away, we had earlier on a macro session, uh, macro and markets, I think we had um, Joyce Chang from JP Morgan. Uh, she highlighted political risk, but long term, you just can't ignore China. And I think we also had Andrew Ang from BlackRock as well, who just, you know, BlackRock just set up a fund in, um, in, in China. So therefore, definitely, um, it is... It is um, a market to be uh, to be in, and 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 like you said, there's a lot more opportunities um, uh, there. Um, you know, the 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 fact that you have this approach where it tends to be not so transparent, uh, etc. Um, I, I I guess my my question in in trying to understand this policy risk, um, do you do you see perhaps? Uh, the Chinese government changing its stance and wanting to be a bit more transparent. I mean, I can appreciate, you know, a couple of decades ago and earlier on where, where you know, it's, it's unrealizable, but now it's so significant. Is, is that going to change or is something that we have to manage going forward? What are your thoughts there? Yeah, I do think, you know, there's a uh, growing recognition uh, within the government uh, that, uh, you know, China now up is uh, normally very large, you know, uh, on the global stage, you know, economically, financially, uh, and whatever the policies, even though with the domestic uh, priorities, goals in mind, uh, but, um, you know, they are inevitably uh, generating global repercussions. Uh, so they have to be more mindful uh, of some of the possible consequences. So to, um, you know, you really try to improve transparency, uh, communications, you know, to really create um, a more uh, consistent and the more predictable uh, policy environment uh, for investors. So, you know, uh, you know, the fact that China has for a long time has been, you know, magnet for foreign investment. So it doesn't mean like China has done everything wrong. You know, clearly China has got many things right. But in this particular aspect, you know, I, uh, first of all, I do think that uh, it remains a significant uh, weakness 
mm-hmm. uh, that the China needs to, uh, you know, cognize uh, of and uh, make efforts to uh, to change it and improve. You know, I think very recent uh, uh, volatilities, I, my, you know, conversations with many, you know, some of the smartest uh, technocrats and uh, policymakers, I very much, um, you know, know that they are, I focused on these uh, issues and you know uh, interested in uh, in the uh, feedback and hopefully uh, you know next time around you know they will do a better job. Well, well, we hope. But but in the meantime, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna ask a question because, like you said, um, so yes, I mean it's a bit jittery, etc. And sometimes funds have have uh, have have gone away. Um, private equity, however, I mean they they tend to be. Um, um, to, to look at things deeper rather than you know public markets, so, so I, I do appreciate that. But now, now coming in from uh, from Malaysia and 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 I guess Southeast Asia, but Malaysia in particular, uh, you mentioned some very um, uh, you know a lot of interesting um, uh, areas still within China, uh, whether it's uh, robotics, um, AI. Um, pharmaceuticals, you've got ESG um, related growth as well. Um, do you think that is all inbound? And any, what are the thoughts of Chinese companies perhaps in that space looking at outside and, and, and you know, how might Malaysia benefit um, from that? Well, definitely, this is not like a closed to any particular market. You know, so China now is the largest manufacturing economy and also the largest trading economy. So all this, uh, with this technology, uh, breakthrough, uh, new industries, uh, I do think, you know, will benefit uh, um, all our tra- trading partners, particularly uh, our South Asian uh, you know, neighbors, uh, just because we are already uh, very, very important the trading partners to each other. So there's a lot of connectivity uh, to flow of goods and services, uh, increasingly, you know, capital and also uh, people. So, um, you know, if China is successful in, uh, you know, breakthrough technologies, you know, as you know, in consumer internet, we've seen what's happening in Southeast Asia is, you know, maybe less similar to what's happening in the US, but more similar to what's happening in China, right? Mm. For example, this emergence of the super app, that's very much a Chinese uh, less actually American. Uh, so, so I do think there's a lot of synergies, a lot of connectivities, and um, you know, and I'm a big believer, um, you know, the, up to the economic uh, potential in Malaysia, and in particular, but also broadly in uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. And uh, um, you know, I, I think we uh, should take uh, um, really. Uh, be take a long view and uh, explore the every opportunity to partner. Uh, just um, you know, reinforce, uh, reinforce the uh, the connectivity, deepen the integration. Uh, you know, that will be uh, our benefits uh, to all the participants and to Asia Pacific uh, 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 as large. I'm I'm going to turn to another uh, question, which is also um, I guess being talked about. Um, and and that is because um, a, a lot of it that we've talked about is is in China itself, um, and and a lot of the regulatory changes, which which you know are coming in, it's easier for us to understand. You know, most have a common prosperity, we kind of like appreciate that a lot more. Um, but but also you know you know China being the largest trading partner, as I mentioned, um, uh, you know the trade. And trade flows, uh, global trade flows is is also uh, important for us. Uh, and perhaps we can try to understand that a bit more. What is your take on that, especially with the geopolitical issues and, and you know the trade um, uh, disagreements between the U.S. etc.? I mean, how, how do we see this pan out going forward, in your view? Well, geopolitics is um, you know another risk. We, you know earlier we just talked about it, the uh, domestic rector risk and the policy risk <laughs> within China, but uh, you know geopolitics uh, ge- uh, geopolitical risks is uh, you know really uh, is um, um, uh, for the whole region and for for the whole um, uh, uh, world. You know when the two giants, US and China, uh, you know really compete. 
um, sometimes at the cross purpose, I think do make the world a less um, um, stable place. And, uh, you know, so for investors, that's something we have to watch it. But I think for, for Asia Pacific, you know, uh, we do uh, share so much in common, not just the trade, economic, commercial interest, uh, but also, you know, I think uh, many of the values and the cultural traditions. Uh, I think we probably have better understanding of each other. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, so we um, just, you know, against the, you know, I think over mid long term, actually trade economic integration, you know, is, is really a very, very good safeguard towards regional stability and the peace and opposite possibility, uh, you know. Um, so, so I think, you know, we, you know, despite the, the, the geopolitical uncertainty, uh, you know, Asian economies, you know, particularly, you know, Southeast Asia and, and China need to do everything together to uh, integrate, you know, through trade agreements, uh, through, mm-hmm. you know, in case of China, I think more, you know, FDI into, uh, Southeast Asia, right, to help Southeast to really uh, build and uh, upgrade the manufacturing uh, uh, base. Because, you know, for all the residents, you know, China cannot concentrate the, either in China alone, you know. Mm-hmm. So we'll see more inter-regional trade uh, and the inter-industry trade, right? So more capital flows, you know, long-term capital flows between China and uh, Southeast Asia. Okay? And also some of the technology uh, transfer so, you know, um, I, I think China being a late comer and not, not able to leapfrog, I think that experience actually is very, very relevant to Malaysia and to uh, the rest of the region, you know, in terms of, you know, catch up, um, you know, and, um, you know, making uh, uh, sustained uh, technological progress and the opportunity, you know, with productivity. Uh, right. I, I think, you know, there's a lot to offer. Uh, and, and uh, you know, again, just the potential is enormous. Thank you. Um, so, so we're, we're, um, um, uh, thanks, Fred. I know I'm going to open it up to uh, Q&As. Um, so we'll have some questions from the floor. And we've had a, a you know, like a brief, very broad um, uh, discussion so far. So here's one question from uh, Dato Yvonne Chia. The common prosperity is China's ESG. President Xi takes bold action on the tech monopolies, corruption, all these happening together amidst the global anti-China US tensions. What is your inside view of the possible outcomes? Yeah, Yuan, thank you for your you know, big question. <laughs> Some of them we have already touched in our uh, chat. Uh, but, um, you know, the timing, you know, you're right, it's all, you know, cut together. But, you know, China is always, um, all the changes in China always like compressed in the time frame. <laughs> so one generation, a lot of things happen. Um, you know, I think the other, other outcomes that the technology regulation will make sure the tech sector will be squeezed out some of the excesses. I said, that, and, and, um, you know, like trust, uh, data and uh, privacy. Uh, so they'll be healthier and they, you know, um, so, so, but uh, to your point in terms of geop- geopolitical uncertainty, so clearly the Chinese uh, government does not want to inflict long-term harm to its domestic tax industry, particularly in, in, in a time when there's so-called, you know, rivalry between uh, US and China, when, when US, you know, you know, so China need to make sure uh, its tax sector continues to grow and develop uh, healthily, sustainably. So that doesn't in part, you know, explain the uh, regulation. So the regulation not mean to harm, but to p- promote a uh, healthy uh, development. So if if, US, if China does, you know, achieve parity with the US uh, in technology, you know, in many ways, some are, I think the US still the leader, uh, China is catching up. In some pockets, China now has excellence, you know, but if across the board, China achieves parity, you know, with the U.S., then I hope for that to be a new equilibrium uh, for the world. You know, in terms of stability, strategic stability, and uh, and the security. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, can we have the uh, the next question? Um, how do you interpret the regulatory intervention with Ant Financial? 
and the implications to innovation in fintech, as well as the wider tech sector. Right. So, you know, so this, just be clear, you know, the regulatory actions are not just targeting and or even just Alibaba or just Jack Ma, as um, much of the Western media has been speculating <laughs> for too long. Right. So as of now, it's very clear, it's much broader right, from fintech to e-commerce, um, food delivery to right heading, you know, social media to gaming, you know, now ad tech, you know, it's you know, entire consumer internet space. So it's not just about the fintech, not just kidding, not just about the end, but the end obviously is the biggest, you know, most successful fintech platform, not just in China, probably globally. <laughs> so, you know, not surprisingly, it, it, it got the most of the attention uh, uh, from the government. You know, I, I think mostly the government is again about the financial stability and about the consumer protection, right? As long as, you know, and business model and the technologies, innovations, and the practices are consistent with the government uh, goals of safeguarding broader financial uh, or systemic financial stability, one, and also, you know, consumer protection. I believe very strongly uh, the Chinese government and the regulators continue uh, to support uh, innovation and the, including fintech uh, innovation, actually in some aspects, China leads the world. Maybe this is actually an area. China maybe is even slightly ahead of the US. Thank you. Thanks for that. That's a very good, interesting perspective. Um, uh, the next question. I think there was a question which was um, okay. set up. Okay. Um, can you share with us what's behind China's recent power cuts? as well as its near-term economic impacts to China and perhaps to uh, its global trading partners too, That's from uh, Kenneth Wu. Yeah, great question. So timely, you know, the, the, the power cuts, I think are um, very short term, number one, and I think unnecessary, number two, in my view, because over many years, once and China has done so well for so long, is to build really cutting edge uh, infrastructure, and the opposite, including the power infrastructure. You know, the national grid, which I actually, the company I'm very, very familiar with, is just amazing, you know, in terms of how they run such enormous uh, grid, you know, the world's biggest by any uh, metric uh, for so long, you know, smoothly, safely. Um, so I don't worry about that, um, you know, like a power shortage being uh, a chronic uh, problem like what we see maybe in India uh, and other parts of emerging economies, China doesn't have such a problem. Okay, but the, the power cuts are more driven by, I think, some misguided, overzealous local bureaucrats to meet the so-called um, carbon targets, you know, emission targets. So they thought, you know, basically, you know, uh, to close, you know, uh, some of the power supply would help them achieve. You know, this kind of sheer myopic expediency, uh, you know, it has already caused a uproar and a lot of critical comments uh, within China itself. Um, so, so I think the impact will be uh, uh, short term, but, then, uh, but I do recognize, you know, we are in a, in a stage globally because of the supply chain disruption and the inflation. So anything that could uh, dent China's awesome manufacturing machine and export machine could uh, presumably exacerbate uh, the supply chain uh, imbalance and um, and the inflation pressures. So therefore, some uh, global uh, ramifications. But uh, again, I, I believe these are short short lived. Thanks, uh, thanks for that answer. You, you know, maybe short lived capacity is there. Um, I guess no reason to worry, but it does send a message for people to get on with it, right? So to make sure that they hurry and try to meet the targets. Um, next question. In Primavera's view, is a China ban on cryptocurrency primarily driven by fear of decentralization or is the aggressive sweep driven by something that is inherently deeper in short what is the narrative that China is crafting with the band? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I believe China has oscillated over over the time. You know, they were interested in it, and then they become concerned, they look warm, and they now outright ban. Um, you know, I believe it's not trying to um, uh, block advance of financial technology, like in a blockchain, for example, you know, China just embrace. But they are very skeptical of cryptocurrency. They view it as overly speculative. Uh, they view it could be disruptive for uh, monetary stability, uh, financial stability. Um, they also are concerned about misuse of cryptocurrencies, you know, in the hands of wrong people, you know, whether it's smuggling, tax evasion, or, you know, God forbid, maybe even terrorism. So, you know, that was not unique to China, but definitely given China's uh, political tradition, um, you know, probably they are more focused on, on those type of possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, issues uh, related to uh, cryptocurrencies. Thanks. Thanks for that. It's actually quite interesting because, you know, uh, banks around the world are investing in counter, uh, country financing for terrorism, anti-money laundering, to the banking system and cryptocurrency kind of like bypasses that altogether. So it's actually quite interesting of uh, that that perspective. Um, uh, we, we um, if you don't mind, um, we can just take on just two more questions, perhaps. I know we're, we're slightly over. Um, next question. Uh, this is from Mohammed Nizar Faisal. Um, Education is a key tool of eradicating poverty and is able to close the prosperity gap. <clears throat> Uh, what are your comments on this statement? Yeah, Mohammed, I commend you for you know posing this question. Actually, your statement. That's something that uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, in my lifelong learning, uh, research, and experience really tell me more than any other tools, you know, like tax hikes, redistribution, and uh, and so on, so on, or regulation. Education in the long term is the most effective policy tool to uh, eliminate poverty, as to achieve even better income distribution outcome, like it's a better uh, equality, you know, which we talked about, right? Inequality is uh, not the Chinese problem, but a global problem, uh, including US or Europe. Um, but, you know, I think that's why societies and, uh, you know, governments and also private sector, you know, frankly, we all need to do what we can to invest in education, that including formal, you know, K-12 school education, primary, uh, secondary school education, high education, obviously, but also, you know, lifelong learning, continuous education. You know, we are in the age of AI, right? Our knowledge can be very obsolete very, very quickly. So we need to, you know, keep learning. So, uh, you know, make sure our, uh, you know, workforce, you know, population at the large, you know, continue to uh, to learn. So that's what I, I mean by education. So yes, you know, you, you have asked your own question. I just agree with that fully. Thank you. And maybe one last one. Uh, common prosperity, common to whom? And based on what and on whose narrative? What happens if foreign independent nations do not wish to subscribe to such interference? and to give up large chunks of our sovereignty, our land, et cetera. What are your thoughts? Well, absolutely, I respect that their position. Um, so here, I think the, what the Chinese leaders uh, say, common possibilities for the Chinese people, uh, citizens, that, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, China now means, you know, number of US dollar billionaires, almost like on a par with the US. At the same time, China still, you know, even with the 700 million people out of poverty, they're still poor, right? You know, if you go to, I myself, in my personal finance, you know, going to remote parts of the country, they're still out of poverty. So, um, so here, I think it's worthwhile goal is to make sure if China continue to grow as it has been in the past, make sure the fruits are more widely shared, right? So that's really what it means, uh, you know. So I think different national governments, as I heard just, you know, Malaysian government also has similar policy goals, you know, for uh, Malaysian citizens. Uh, so this is a more for, um, 
you know, their own uh, country, within their own country and uh, the people, not meant to be international, excuse uh, for international intervention uh, and interference. Um, although I would say, you know, we are in the world, you know, like it or not, despite the geopolitics and um, the pandemics, we are in the integrated world. So uh, we need to foster trade, uh, cross-border investment, uh, exchange of uh, ideas, technology transfer, uh, so that we are, there's better hope, uh, you know, if we close to uh, close uh, or resort to high tariff protectionism trade wars, then I think we'll be more, uh, it's more difficult, more elusive uh, towards the uh, common prosperity goal. So I do think, yes, there's a distinctive national policies but I think there will be, um, you know, global uh, coordination and uh, cooperation. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Fred. I think that was the, our last question. And Fred, you know, on behalf of Kazana and, and all the audience here, um, we thank you so much for joining us uh, this afternoon. And it's been a real privilege for me to meet you and, and, and ask you uh, these questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for your moderation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. <laughs>